In this batch of gravy, SFA explores barbecue. Listen as we spread the coals, flip the hog, and stir the mop. Along the way, we'll share stories of Southern pitmasters from Idaho to South Carolina. And speaking of South Carolina... In this episode, you'll meet Dr. Howard Conyers. Born in a small town in Paxville, South Carolina... Howard went on to earn a Ph.D. in mechanical engineering with a specialty in aeroelasticity from Duke University. And yes, that means he's a rocket scientist. He currently works at NASA. Dr. Conyers is also a barbecue historian and a pitmaster. He spent years researching the black origins of barbecue and has traveled the world gathering stories from folks who work the pits. His passion for barbecue comes from his own childhood. He grew up in a family of skilled barbecue cooks. Howard now lives in New Orleans, and he travels home to South Carolina often to barbecue with his family. In this special episode of Gravy, Howard interviews his father, Harrison Conyers, whom Howard likes to think of as a hidden figure in the world of barbecue. You're listening to Gravy. 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 A production of the Southern Foodways Alliance. Gravy tells stories of the changing American South. After this quick break, settle in to learn about barbecue from Harrison Conyers. Named one of the best podcasts you should listen to in 2022 by Digital Trends, the latest season of Vanishing Postcards finds host Evan Stern motoring west, cross-country on Route 66, featuring stories collected over 6,845 miles of asphalt. This season is an immersive listen, perfect for when you need a breather but don't have the luxury of hitting the open road. Follow Vanishing Postcards wherever you get your podcasts. Hi, I'm Howard Conyers. In digging to understand the roots of barbecue over the years, the point of my work has been to shine a spotlight on the countless unknown black barbecue cooks. In my life, the people who did barbecue, the whole hall variety were primarily black people in my community, even if the restaurant was white owned in the rare cases that I had to go to one. In a five mile radius from where I'm from, there was not a shortage of whole hog barbecue cooks. And I did not have to say whole hog barbecue, just barbecue in itself was known as such. The face of anything often omit the opportunity to hear from the teacher. In my own case, many people have heard my story as being a rocket scientist pitmaster. On my journey in regards to the actual cooking barbecue, my father, whom many have never heard from, is the foundation of my barbecue working journey. My dad, Harrison Conyers, provided knowledge, expertise, and labor for me to be successful. My dad, like other barbecue cooks, are really the hidden figures. Hidden Figures is one of my favorite movies, and not because I work in STEM. It's because what the book made movie represents. Plus, it does not hurt that it relates to my career in engineering. In this story, the world remembers astronaut John Glenn Voyage, but no one remembers the women that provided the calculations of human computers and what they had to endure in society in a white man's world. I compare the women behind John Glenn to the countless names of the unknown, unsung barbecue cooks that drove the pits that built barbecue legacies for often white-owned families and businesses, particularly in the South. Let's be honest. White Americans were not allowing too many black families to own many legalized businesses in the South as demonstrated during Reconstruction. So as I got on my journey in barbecue in a public way, I know my work built upon the work of Ed Mitchell, who was ahead of his time, and he cleared the wood so I could put the land back into production. However, my father provided my seeds to understand the barbecue as a child in the 1980s. So the most instrumental person to barbecue and the work to help get black people recognized as my father, Harrison, a true hidden figure, but giant to barbecue. I introduce to you my father and guest, Harrison Conyers. Barbecue relationship to farming is critical, and without farming, the whole hog barbecue tradition would not have been saved. A glimpse into my father's farming background helps one seize an overlooked part of barbecue culture. We are going to take a look at the farmer's tradition of my father's youth that is also similarly found in barbecue cultures around the American South. 
particularly in rural areas? My family was a farmer, sharecropper, and um, we live in the rural section of Clarendon County. Okay. Near Paxville, Manning, uh, home, in the home branch section of Clarendon County. When your family was a sharecropper um, or farmer, what, what crops were they growing? They were growing corn, soya beans, um, that was the basic, and tobacco. That was the basic crops. Tobacco always was considered as a money crop. Yeah, and no cotton? Yeah, a little bit of cotton, not much. When y'all went to sell the tobacco, y'all sell it here? Or did where y'all take the tobacco? You know where your father sold the tobacco? He used to sell it to um, Timmonsville and Lake City. That was about uh, 45 miles from here. And, and we always would leave uh, on, if they gonna, the tobacco going to be sell tomorrow, then we would leave probably about 6 o'clock the following day. And then we would spend the night at the tobacco market. And that was fun for me and my baby brother, Joseph. We would always get the opportunity to go and spend the night at the tobacco market. We always enjoy riding on the back of the truck to the uh, to Lake City or Timmonsville. And we would spend the night where it wasn't a hotel, so we would always wrap up in sheets and sleep on the back of the truck. But then when we get to the tobacco market, there'd always be a lot of young boys that we would always meet and always play with at, uh, all during the night, uh, playing on the sheets of the back of just having fun. But it was very in interesting in doing that. Farming culture is critical to the barbecue tradition landscape in this country and the black hands that worked the fields during the era of people of my father's generation and before. By the time the tradition landed into my father's hands, the tradition was at least 300 years old. When we come back, we'll learn a little bit of what Harrison Conyers knows about building a pips. But first... Simmons Catfish is a family-owned business that calls the Mississippi Delta home. The company is committed to quality catfish and, most importantly, to its employees. My name is Maria Sparza and I've been here 20 years at Simmons. I was born in Mexico but I was raised in West Laco, Texas. When I was 19, they brought us over here to Simmons on a working contract, and I haven't went nowhere since then. Maria works as a strip table supervisor, cutting fish at the Simmons Processing Plant in Yazoo City, the same Delta town that gave us author Willie Morris. The Simmons Company recently honored her 20 years of service. Simmons marked her anniversary with a gift of a living room set, a dining room set, and more. She recalls the celebration fondly. Our people from the plant, they gave me some presents. I mean, it just felt good. They all got up, applause. It's just feeling good that you do for them and they do for you and they love you. I mean, like I said, this is family right here. We didn't go nowhere. You ain't gonna find another job like this. The next time you crave catfish, baked, fried, or in a stew, Look for Simmons Farm Raised Catfish, a driver of the Delta economy, an employer with integrity, the home of Willie Morris and Maria Esparza. A list of vendors is online at SimmonsCatfish.com. For their commitment to quality catfish, their belief in their employees, and their support of this podcast, we thank them. Barbecue to most people that have come across the day think it is a brisket. Not the whole hall variety that Rodney Scott is ensuring that the world know about through his restaurants. In addition to the whole hog, the version of Southern barbecue that eluded my work at understanding how the whole cow barbecue was executed in the American South, as steers and ox were in the literature. I mentioned earlier that whole hog barbecue was a given in my community. People only cook whole hogs primarily. That's because biologically hogs reproduce easily and cooking a whole hog was more practical to feed 50 to 75 people 
on a farm per hog cooked. A whole barbecue cow was not practical during my father's era, as most black families, if they were fortunate to have a cow, it was solely for milking. Barbecue and whole cows was mainly done for very large gatherings with hundreds to thousands of people. From my research, whole cows were mostly cooked in quarters to help with the maneuvering on the pit. I have read rare instances where a series of pulleys and cables were used to maneuver the whole cow, but that does not seem as elegant of a solution that modern engineering can enable. In my work over the past eight or so years, I maybe was the front man when it came to executing barbecue at various events. But for some of the most significant events, my father was the greatest sitting figure in my work, as he done significant work. For what I say, is one of my top five most memorable cooks, probably number one or two, is the cooking of a whole cow. It would not have been possible without him. So let's get some backstory from my father, the master weather that brought my design to life that I used for an event called Gumbo Jubilee that I produced in New Orleans. Well, when he mentioned it about cooking a cow, first thing went through my mind, he sounded like he was crazy, but then um, I realized I seen on TV, I see the Western cooking cows, the, the way they used to do it, they flip it every so often. And uh, I, I, I was thinking about how would you do it? And I realized that the pit that I use, it didn't have a mechanism in it to turn the cow because you need um, something to turn the cow every so often. And some pits did have something like a rotisserie in it. And I would, I thought when he mentioned it, probably about a year earlier, I stopped thinking about making the uh, making a pit big enough to cook a cow. Then the, one of the main things is finding out what size cow he w wanted to cook. So after we got that narrowed down, then I, we decided we were going to make it. My father did all of the pit manufacturing, and I provided just a small piece of design to help him turn the cow. He made the part rotating in one section because I had the great idea to attach it to my old pit in New Orleans. However, experience matters, and I defer to masters of their craft. After we made the top part of it and test that and find out that it would work, then uh, the height of the pit, and he want to put it on the existing pit, but his existing pit was in Louisiana. And I was working on it in South Carolina, so I tell him the best thing to do, the simplest thing, is just make another, the complete pit. And um, and and that way we could uh, it, when that when we get the ticket to Louisiana, all we had to do is put it on his trailer. Yep. And, and uh, we made it, and um, I was gonna put it. Well, when I made it, make it, I did it where it would be, um, you could have bolted it together. Once the top part of the pit was built, we needed it to test it using things on the farm, similarly as we do rocking and testing, which requires one to test systems before the big hot fire. So I took the philosophy from my day job and applied it to barbecue for cooking a whole cow by assimilating weight. What we did is um, I took some track well, I had some tractor weights. Uh, they were, um, the tractor weights weigh about a hundred pounds a piece. And what we done is take the tractor weights and put them on the four corners. That would have been at 400 pounds. In other words, that would have been about the weight of the cow that we was planning on cooking. And we um, bought them to the um, frame of the uh, the the rotisserie part of the uh grill and we turn it to see how easy it turned and it really worked perfect it really worked put perfect in other words the grill that we designed it probably would actually you could probably put a, at least 
about a no more than about a six hundred pound tile on it if you want to barbecue it. People did not realize that I thought about how to cook the cow for six months and about another six months to design the pit for the cow. There are videos online at PBS. What people fail to realize is that my father was a master welder of about 40 years when he built the pit. So to ensure my event success, my father brought the cow pit to New Orleans on his pickup truck, literally. To this day, I don't know how he packed it all in his Ford pickup. I decided I was going to um, rent a trailer to, and, and put it on the trailer. You haul uh, they tell me they would rent a trailer. I went to pick the trailer up, and the, the trailer, they, they tell me I could pick it up. I couldn't take it out of South Carolina. That wasn't going to do me any good. So what I did is I bring uh, come back home, take it apart, and put it on the back of my pickup truck, and we took it to uh, Louisiana on the back of the truck everything that I need. I wanted to cook the cow in a manner similar to the hog, as they said in the history books, my slave ancestors would do it in this way. As the technique was pretty similar to how we cook hogs, except we wanted to cook above ground and have an easy way to turn the cow. We reassembled the pit on the trailer in New Orleans that my father brought down and we cooked the cow. The cooking the cow, it was, it was a challenge, but it really was a great experience and it one thing when we finished cooking it, the cow fall, the meat just fall off the bone. And one thing I could say about that seemed like it would be all these different parts of the cow, uh, the uh, beef, kind of like all of it blend together, and it give it, it give it a different flavor. When you get everything, the different cuts of meat, all of it blend together, that would made the made it taste a whole lot different and it was really good it really was really good the successful whole cow barbecue cook was a success because of my father he was the most valuable person when it came to executing a whole cow barbecue on a pit that mimics the one of yesteryear except it was above ground with engineering sophistication while the cow pit was sophisticated let's look at the barbecue pit that he and countless other people of his era and before knew in the ground these pits, the spikes in the ground, the basic construction improved, for example, instead of using tree limbs, people started using metal pipes as America evolved. Barbecue will change as America progress, but it's important that the past is not forgotten. So let's hear about my father's early barbecue memory before cinder block pits or the infamous burn barrel. Well, when at my earliest uh, experience with cooking it as a child, they would always dig a hole in the ground, probably maybe about five foot long, about th about three to four foot wide. And it would be probably about 18, to two, 18 inches to two foot deep. And then they, on the ends of it, which would be the narrow side, they would always kind of like on the ends, it would be a little bit longer, but they would, use a, a uh, have a hollow with, on an angle where they could put fire from both ends. You always fire the hands and the sh hams and shoulders. And then they would always, um, what they would do with the pit is they would have, you maybe use pump pipe. They would, pretty much would be pump pipe and hog wire. They would take about three pieces of pump pipe the hand pump is attached to wells to pull out water out of the ground with four times electricity. Yeah, it would be pipes probably about, it would be about an inch and a quarter uh, in diameter. And um, maybe about, it would be long, it, it would, if the, the hole they're going to use is four foot, it might be about five foot. They would have it where they, it would be long enough where they could, um, uh, it would uh, always be on solid ground, and um, and then they would, they would use the fence wire to lay it across the um, those three um, pieces of pump pipe, and then that where they would use to put that lady hog on it would be it is of uh, uh, the inside of the hog. They would lay that face down on the pit. Real cat, oh, that would be down toward the fire. And then during the, t um, 
then what they would do is they didn't have burn barrels back then. What they would do is cut the wood in probably um, four or five foot pieces. And they would be some t between, they would use a piece probably about a foot, about 12 inches in diameter. And they would um, lay it down and then they would stack the wood on one end of it. It would kind of be like a on a kind of a angle, and then they would uh, always um, then they would build a fire, and it being it was kind of that one end would be raised and the other end on the ground. It would be kind of like an angle that they would use um, to get the coal. Use the shovel. They would always use a square point shovel. They would um, scoop it out of the uh, the coal out of the um uh fire and use that to feed the whole uh supply the coals to put under the whole under the whole by the time i started being around barbecue as a young child in the 1980s my father had already transitioned to cooking barbecue above ground in an old refrigerated pit my father converted an old international refrigerator with a single external door not the type today where the freezer and the refrigerator portion have separate doors fast forward to 2022 would I know that barbecue would lead me down a rabbit hole in the briar patch to try to understand the roots of American barbecue because the story and the books were disjointed? The things I learned about barbecue was from lived experiences or what was passed down orally. So in digging into research, I noticed a lot of gaps in context from the events of American barbecue. Yes, it was black people that combined and evolved the practice of barbecue as we know it in the southern United States. For what the research lacked, I went back to experimental cooking in the ground like my father and his teachers of the craft. While you wait on the book, I encourage you to read more of my work on my blog or IG. Howard Conyers reported this episode of Gravy, and Trey Foxworth III produced it. We thank Wendell Patrick for Gravy's theme music and Jazar for our donor music. Managing editor for Gravy and all other SFA publications is my co-host, Sarah Camp Milam. Gravy's publisher is Mary Beth Lassiter. The heavy editing lift for this season of Gravy comes by way of Olivia Terenzio. And Katie King is our fact checker. Did this episode whet your appetite for barbecue? Join us for our barbecue symposium, October 21st and 22nd here in Oxford. Together we'll ask questions about what barbecue is, who makes it, and we'll learn how the craft is changing. Visit us at southernfoodways.org to buy your tickets and to learn more about the event. While you're there, become a member or make a donation. Your dollars fund our work and help us make more gravy. I'm Melissa Hall. And I'm Sarah Camp Milam. Excited to lap up another episode of Gravy? Tell a friend. Pass the gravy boat. There's plenty to go around. <laughs> <laughs>